that one was uh, obviously sent by mistake. It's about 20 years old. <laughs> but um, I still am in the same department, uh, the Initiative for Vaccine Research, having in the meantime wandered around and done a few other things within WHO. And in these various things that I've been doing for the last several years, we've been touching on the issue of vaccinating older adults, on antimicrobial resistance, and on actually how do we communicate the value of vaccines. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave straight after my talk because there is a bit of a chaos happening at WHO today. Uh, Jean Lang knows all about it because there is an, a slight problem has been observed with the dengue vaccine. And I leave it to Jean to maybe give more details later on, but I have to run back and sort this out. And this is one of the issues that we have to be cautious of, is how do we communicate when things actually do start going wrong? So quickly, vaccines adding life to years. Why life to years, not years to life? We want to live a good quality life. We don't want to necessarily live longer, increasingly decrepit, and just keep on disintegrating. So what's happening across the world? We are, we are in here in Europe, but we're not going to talk just about Europe. What we see is that across all the regions, the different colors represent the different regions of WHO. Orange is Africa, the, the, the purple Asia, blue Europe, the green is um, Latin America and Caribbean, and the red, North America. So we can see that across all regions, life expectancy is going up, but there's still a huge discrepancy in these life expectancies. And when we look very specifically at the extremes, we've got Japan, where it is now quite normal to reach 85, 90 years old. And at the lower end of the spectrum, we've got Sierra Leone, where a short while ago, a life expectancy of 45 was the norm. So we've got this huge discrepancy across the regions. And then what is also very important is what is happening to the older population. When we think of the old population, I presume most of you think of us here in the Northern Hemisphere, in Europe, Japan, and USA. But what we can see is that that was the, well, it, it, it was the case in 1970. So most, the, the number of, of old people, that's people above the age of 60, living in industrialized countries was about the same as those in the developing countries. Because in the developing countries, they tended to die before getting to 60. Well, by 2002, the low, lower resource, the less developed regions, that's in the middle bar, were actually had exceeded the industrialized countries for having the old population. But by 2025, seven years time, you will see what most of the old people on Earth are going to be living in the developing countries. And here we're running into the situation that the industrialized countries became rich before they became old, but the developing countries are becoming old before they became rich. And this is going to have an impact on their health and especially the last few years of life. So like many of you, I, I began much of my career looking at immunization of children. I remember when I met Mark Kane for the first time at WHO many years ago, he said to me, Martin, the first day of life is the most dangerous. And then as I entered this, the gerontologist said, no, that's wrong. It's the last day that is the most dangerous. <laughs> and so, so we've got to think about what happens as you get towards that last day. And we've got these contrasting realities. So we've got there on the left-hand side, a typical, maybe uh, could be a Northern European, could be United States uh, a couple there. And then on the right, potentially somebody of exactly the same chronological age. But because they're coming from a different environment, their biological age might be completely different. So this now is going to impact how we think about policy. Because if we say, well, in Europe, uh, we think that this vaccine should be given at the age of 65. Well, what about in India, in the rural part of India? What about in urban Tokyo? H how, do we, how do we compare? Because chronological age and biological age are not going to be the same. And then also the ability of these people to pay for the treatment and their underlying metabolic disorders are going to impact First of all, the susceptibility to infectious diseases, but also the impact of the vaccines. So as we, we've already seen that the population is growing older everywhere, that we've got these huge differences, but there is one commonality. And that's unfortunately bad news for all of us in this room, especially for some of us who are a bit older than the others. And that is 
the last years are going to be spent in poor health. So it does not matter if you are in Sierra Leone with a life expectancy of 50 years old or you're in Japan with a life expectancy of 90 years old. On average, you will spend between five to 10 years in bad health. Men will die before women. And since in many cultures, the men tend to have younger women as their partners, this means that women will be spending an ex extensive amount of time without the support going on. And that might also mean without the financial support. But just bear that in mind. Enjoy it now while you can, because it ain't going to last. So what is going on in the old people? So here we can see leading causes of death. I emphasize death. Um, uh, and this, this is across the low and middle income countries by age. You can see on the far left the white part. So um, where's, where's the pointer here? Okay. So white is communicable diseases. Okay. Uh, blue is injuries, and then orange is non-communicable diseases. So you can see the, young, in the youngsters, the main cause of death is communicable diseases. And by the time we get to above 60 years old, communicable diseases is very small. So you could argue, yeah, it's a, a small percentage. Why are we going to bother with vaccination for this population? Well, we, we then have to go and look at actually what does infection really cause? And it's hard to quantify, but this is an example taken from the USA looking across the death registries from 1959 through to uh, 2000. And you can see that uh, here we've got ischemic heart disease, so the mortality due to, uh, you've got to have something on the autopsy. You're not allowed to die of old age these days. You have to die of something. So these people died of ischemic heart disease, these ones of cancer, these ones of cardiovascular disease, these ones of diabetes. And here we can see right at the bottom the pneumonia and influenza. But what is interesting is all of these other diseases, we have the seasonality. And we think that this seasonality, this is what we call the excessive mortality. This is the people that have got ischemic heart disease, but they died because they got influenza. But that doesn't go down on the autopsy as influenza. It goes down as ischemic heart disease. So what we should be doing is actually calculating all of these peaks and putting them all together. And then we will see that actually the death due to influenza and pneumonia and it might be parainfluenza, other, uh, other respiratory diseases might be enormous. So where are we going to go with this? Let's look at functional course over life. So in your early life, this is where we start having fun. Things are good. We've got growth and development, and we, are, we have become very effective. We go running. We go climbing. And then here during our adult life, we start getting a decrease in function. We sit at a desk in the WHO. We don't move. The gout from the uh, alcohol consumption begins to set in, and we see a gradual decline. Now, what can happen is if you've got excessive alcohol consumption or you don't move at all, you're going to have this slightly increased, dis increased, thing, increased decline. And what we've got to worry about here is this disability threshold, where as you go below this, this is where life becomes really unpleasant. So you're not dead yet, but you are, you maybe you would prefer to be, because this is, this is unpleasant. So what we'd like to do is maintain you up here where you are able to function. Now, how does infectious disease affect us? Well, first of all, let's look at what's happened over the last several decades. In the 1980s, it was act what actually happened is you went from being a functional person to, to being this kind of person, and then to the wheelchair. And this was by sort of this transition here, from here to here, happened in the mid to uh, early to mid 60s, and this transition here happened by mid 70s. Now, by the 1990s, we've actually improved in the, w in the northern hemisphere, uh, especially with the richer northern hemisphere. We've, we've, we've gone further on. You, t you can typically expect to live to have quality life to about 70. You then go into this partial decline, and you actually hit this terminal uh, phase of decline by, by the late 80s. Then into the 2000s, we actually still have people participating in marathons um, into, into their late 60s. That's not me. Um, and then 
you know, this, this, this is w sort of where I am now um, to, to the mid-80s before we get this, fun this final decline. So what's great is we've moved the quality of life on and on and on. We've added life to years, not years to life, because the, the point of the, the final point of death, although we've added a few years, is pretty much the same there. Now, where does infectious disease come into this? It is really primarily through what we call a catastrophic disability. So catastrophic disabilities is where we, we say there's a loss of independence in greater than three, I've just forgotten what ADL stands for. Uh, a ten, a, right, right, okay, thank you. And 72% of people who experience catastrophic disability have been hospitalized. And what are the causes for this? Strokes, um, pneumonia, and influenza come second. Okay, this transition from here to here and I'm sure each of you must have a personal anecdote of the parent who was hospitalized, lay in the hospital bed for two weeks, pulmonary edema, whatever it was, and then after that, they stood up, and the last two or three years after that were not very comfortable. We can all tell the story. Ischemic heart disease is, is third, cancer, and hip fracture. But what's very important there is pneumonia and influenza. So what we want to do with vaccines is avoid at least one of these because this will also impact the, uh, uh, the, the, the strokes possibly, it will impact ischemic heart disease. Will it impact cancer? Well, Marx uh, brought up the question that maybe things like cervical cancer, liver cancer, uh, gastric cancer, <coughs> etc. cetera. Um, hip fracture, well, I think vaccines can't yet solve hip fracture. So. Despite widespread vaccination, we've seen over the last 20 years, hospitalization rates have increased, influenza and pneumonia deaths have increased, and influenza-related all-cause mortality has increased. And very importantly for this group is that the effectiveness for preventing infections in these older adults has been questioned. Do we have effective vaccines? Do we have effective policies for adult vaccination? I can give you the answer there, no, we don't. And do we have effective methods to reach adults with vaccines? And again, the answer is no. So I'll walk through a few examples. Let's begin with this one, pneumonia. Our focus with pneumonia vaccines is under the age of two and very much so under the age of one. But where is the hospitalization taking place? It's taking place over here. So this is, uh, this is where I am now. Uh, so I'm about to start being in this risk group here of high risk of hospitalization, which for the, for the later on in the session, in, in, in this meeting, this is also where your antibiotics are being used, not so much over here. This is oral antibiotics. This is intravenous antibiotics. So here what you can see with these three lines is this is after the introduction in the infants of the pneumoconjugate vaccine. So the pneumoconjugate vaccine has an impact quite significant on the carriage and the incidence of pneumonia in infants. And through herd immunity, it is having an impact on the old people. However, what we don't know is, are the strains here the same as the strains here? And we're beginning to think, no. So maybe, maybe we should be thinking about having a pneumonia vaccination policy here. One or two countries are beginning to suggest this, but the polysaccharide, 24 valent polysaccharide vaccine, efficacy is kind of so-so. Nobody's really looked at its impact on hospitalization. What we, what we do think is that the vaccination of this population here could be very good if it was to work. And then the question is, at what age do you give it? And is that a chronological age or is it a biological age? Here's another uh, piece of data from Europe. This is tetanus. Now we've all in this room, we've all been vaccinated against tetanus. And I'm sure that if we were all to go gardening, and prick our fingers with the spade or whatever it is, we would not get tetanus. However, in Europe, most of the tetanus is in people above 65 years of age. Why? First of all, they're the ones that are out there doing gardening. But also, probably the last time they got their tetanus vaccine was somewhere round about military service over here, maybe, uh, whatever it was. And this has made all the more problematic by the fact that old people actually don't maintain their antibodies for very long. So here we're looking at different age groups. So the orange is young people, the red are those of us that are over the hill. And here we can see the number of years since the last vaccination. 
And here you can see that um, in, in young people, when you've got sort of one to five years, um, uh, they, they've, it's up there, the old people has already dropped. By 10 years, the old people, the antibody titers are almost down, down to nothing. And by 11 to 15 years, this is probably no longer at a protective level. So we've got to be vaccinating the old people more frequently. So this then brings up the question of what is happening with the immune function in old people? And I'm just going to have one single slide on this. Uh, let's just do all, all of this like this. And this is where I was young. This is where I probably am now. Let's call this an elderly type one, you know, out on the golf course playing golf. And this is your type two, which is maybe where the golf, the golf is just something that they can vaguely remember, if they can remember at all. And <laughs> What we're looking at here is the ratio of memory T cells to effector cells. And essentially what this means is you, you, you reach a biological age where your body is actually no longer able to make a new naive, resp a new response to a new antigen. Everything is just there handling the existing infections. And if you happen, to, unfortunately, to have cytomegalovirus infection, which most of us in this room probably do, your entire immune system might be focused just on handling that CMV. So, but what we can see here then is th the antibody response to vaccination. Now this is antibody and we know that antibodies aren't all the story. But here we've got the young people, here we've got the type one elderly, and here we've got this population here where we typically see a ratio of CD8s to CD4s where the CD8s exceed the CD4s. I won't go into detail on this, partly because I don't understand all of it. But the, what the message here is, old people, it's not just being old. It's got a biological age, and the biological age is linked to many things. First of all, this timic involution, that when the timus involutes somewhere in the late <coughs> 40s, early 50s, no more generation of naive T cells, gradual using up of those T cells. Maybe there's something, a function of how many infections the person had in their past life, schistosomiasis, TB, um, HCV, HIV, whatever. Chewing up the memory T cells and giving an increasing number of effector T cells. And this group here, if you vaccinate them, it won't work. So that means we've got to get two people before, well, while they're still here. And the problem is it's not going to be the same chronological age in India as it is in Switzerland. So the vaccines don't work very well. This is the only side I will have on influenza, I think. Um, we need to improve the efficacy. So influenza, as has already been mentioned, we've had some talks about influenza vaccination in young children, efficacy 50, 60%. By the time we get to old people, the standard inactivated influenza vaccine, even in the type one old people, is only is hovering around about 40%. And by the time you get to type two, it's dropping off even further. I had another slide which actually showed the data, but I took it out because I didn't want to be sued by industry for showing bad data. So what has been done to address this is looking at different ways of vaccinating old people. So um, Sanofi developed an intradermal delivery of influenza vaccine. Jean, I think this was taken off the market recently. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why. But then, so what did work very well was to give a much higher dose of antigen in old people to improve the efficacy. And uh, uh, what has also been looked at, so uh, Novartis had the flu ad which contained an adjuvant. Again, the data to support its, it was more immunogenic, but was it more efficacious? Uh, it depends on which way you held the paper up to the light. So, um, but the one area where adjuvants have shown that this can really help um, vaccines is with herpes zoster. And there's a talk early, uh, just after lunch, about herpes zoster. So I'm just going to have one quick slide on this. So for those of you that haven't yet had the pleasure of having herpes zoster, uh, if you had chickenpox when you were young, you're probably going to get this later on in your life. And in most cases, it's going to be relatively harmless for the last two to three weeks of discomfort. In a few cases, you're going to get post-hepatic neuralgia, which can last two to three years of extreme pain. So if we can get a vaccine against this, it would be very good. 
Merck had a vaccine or has a vaccine which has been on the market for some time and this is a live attenuated vaccine and it's got it's got reasonable efficacy as you can see here and but uh, this non it's it's not it's it could be better it's about 50 percent the this is live vaccine so if there's any immune memory to zoster the live vaccine will not work very well. So GSK has just very recently, it was approved a very short while ago in the US, launched an adjuvanted, so it's a recombinant protein with an adjuvant. And this now bypasses the, the challenges that a live vaccine has in old people and is providing um, apparently a very good efficacy in the between 70 and 80% um, <laughs> and even in very old people. So it is possible that the addition of a potent adjuvant will enable a, de a declining immune function of immunosenescence to, to develop an effective uh, immune response to protect all people. The other targets, RSV, you might have been following the bad news of uh, Novavax, sorry, this was not Novavax. Novavax had one failure, but then Medimmune did a study and observed that vaccinating old people for with their RSV vaccine, for some of the people it worked, and for some of them it actually made them actually more susceptible to the disease, which reminds us of what happened in the 1960s with our RSV vaccine in children. We could be making vaccines against pertussis. Um, old people suffer from this. And then, of course, that all of the, the, the diseases which are coming up where antimicrobial resistance is critical of Staph aureus, E. coli, Acinetobacter, and others. My final slide is, is the challenge of actually reaching adults with vaccines. Now, we've already discussed reaching children with vaccines. We've had discussed the challenges of reaching adolescents with vaccines. And if you think that's difficult, try and get old people to be vaccinated. So this is a, a short survey that was conducted um, by, by a group um, where they, uh, I'm not going to show all the slides that they had, um, they asked, uh, they went to the pharmacies, they asked physicians to ask the question, and asked adults why they didn't get vaccinated. And this was about influenza. And you can see the, the, the reasons. Vaccine is not effective. The vaccine causes influenza. Influenza can be treated. Annual vaccination is annoying. Vaccine has side effects. My doctor does not recommend it. Many experts are against the vaccine, etc., etc. And soon to be added to this is the effect that annual vaccination can actually make you more susceptible to it and that this is soon this is about to become a very well known fact so we've got the challenge of getting people to first of all recognize that these infectious diseases can actually have a major impact on their quality of life they're not going to die of influenza they're not going to die of pneumonia but they're going to finish up in a wheelchair because of it and we've got the challenge of actually getting a vaccine that is effective in this population and working out at what age should we vaccinate them. And once we've worked out at what biological age they should be vaccinated, working out what chrono chrono chronologic chronological age does this correlate to, and then actually getting them to come to the doctor or to the pharmacy and receiving those vaccines. So my conclusions, because it's now time, really time for lunch, Yes, it can, infection can cause an irretrievable loss of quality of life. Once you're in the wheelchair, you don't really stand up again. Vaccines should be able to reduce the risk of infection and extend duration of quality life, not duration of life. Waiting until adults are old before vaccinating is too late. And policy on vaccinating adults during life course would be ideal. However, we need supporting evidence. The clinical trials on this are scarce and very complex. One of the challenges is the huge number of uh, severe adverse events called death that happen in this age group. And it, we need a platform for reaching adults with vaccines. And that until we develop this platform, we're just going to be messing around. Thank you.